These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Welcome to the Iron Age. If you're watching on YouTube, you already know that something's changed on the channel, but either way, stay tuned until the end for a pretty big channel update. Today, though, we'll begin with King Ashurdan II, who will rule from 935 to 912 BCE and pretty much hit the ground running. The thing which will be called the Neo-Assyrian Empire is, in many respects, already in place, and it's at this point just a matter of the rest of the Near East realizing what's been right next door the whole time. This may sound sudden, but that's because it kind of is. The Assyrian Empire, considered by some to have been the world's first true empire, is going to explode out of nowhere to completely reshape human history in a way that few other historical entities ever have. And the seed for such an event is when you have the right person in the right place at the right time. The right person is Asher Dan, and we'll look at him in a bit. The right place at the right time, though, is a function principally of climate change and technological change in the wider Near East. Both of these two things have been long, slow trends which are only now coming to fruition in the region. The longest and slowest of these trends is unquestionably the technological change, principally in the form of ironworking. I should emphasize that we're going to be talking just about iron today, but in fact, there are a number of industries that look at least a bit different from how they did a few hundred years ago, and not just because they're now integrating iron to a greater and greater extent. But we're not going to be looking at those other industries today. Just keep them in the back of our mind until we can get to them in future episodes. But the star of our show today is iron, because this is the Iron Age, and so, of course, that's what everyone's excited about. Except... When we look deeper into the historical record, for sure iron is what we, as much later historians and archaeologists call it, but it's far from clear that the people living through it would have considered it to be anything like an Iron Age. There is a lot about our iron story which is unclear, but it's highly unlikely that anyone lived through a noticeable transition in the forging or use of iron. And indeed, our iron transition story is not one of a few decades, not even confined to a few centuries directly following the Bronze Age collapse, but it's one spanning at least a millennium. You see, though we're now at 935 BCE, and thus at the opening of the Iron Age in Mesopotamia, there has been iron being mined and forged for at least a thousand years before this. Indeed, there are even a handful of iron goods dated to before 3000 BCE, though these are extremely few and in very limited applications. But it's important to know that the Sumerians had a word for iron all the way back in the Sumerian period. The metal has been known about and experimented with for as long as metallurgy has existed. And as well it should have been, iron is vastly more abundant than copper, the main metal of the Bronze Age. Most prestigious, of course, is meteoric iron, which was known in ancient times to have fallen from the sky, and was thus extremely highly regarded. It came from the sky, that's really cool. But also, many copper ore types actually have iron mixed in with them, which comes out in the slag during typical copper smelting. Also, many areas in the mountainous uplands have surface or near-surface deposits of good iron, which are either obvious to anyone who just knows what to look for, or just easily discovered by accident while mining other goods, or sometimes even just plowing a field. This abundance led to fairly regular experimentation over the centuries, and the finds of ironworked products and mentions of iron in texts slowly increases until the final century of the Late Bronze Age, where it begins to rise noticeably, though still as a minority luxury metal. The reason it stays a niche product is that while iron is abundant, it's also more technically challenging to work with 
at this time. The fundamental issue is heat. Copper and bronze can melt at around 1200 Celsius or less, and 1200 is about the maximum that Bronze Age people knew how to get their furnaces to achieve. Iron requires heat above 1500 degrees in order to melt, which means that Bronze Age people were unable to ever have pure or even slightly pure iron to work with, and applications which involved pouring of molten metal were at this point beyond them. Second to the pure issue of heat is heat consistency. Ancient furnaces relied on bellows, which is basically a hand pump, to put more air into the fire than could be achieved by natural circulation. In theory, you can pump a bellows at a constant rate and pressure for hours and hours on end, and thereby achieve a constant temperature the entire time in your furnace. You'd add charcoal at precisely the right time, and you'd keep the fuel-to-air mix constant. Of course, in practice, pumping a bellows for even like 15 minutes is wretched hard work, and you don't have precise feedback on how you're pumping, you just have a subjective perception of the flame's color, the flame's size, and the heat sensation. And a lot of the time it's the guy working the forge that gets the subjective perception of how the forge is going, whereas the bellower just has to like, oh, he's saying I gotta pump it harder. Okay, I'm gonna pump it hard. No, that's too hard. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go down. And all the meanwhile, you're getting exhausted. This means that Bronze Age furnaces were almost certainly extremely inconsistent in temperature, with fluctuations of hundreds of degrees possible, sometimes within the same hour, and many heating runs requiring most of the day to complete. Now, with copper and many of the early metals, this isn't much of a problem. Copper is relatively simple to work with, and if the temperature surges or falls, that's just going to affect the time that the process takes, not the end result. Iron, however, has multiple distinct allotropes, which if you forgot your chemistry class, that means that the atoms within the iron rearrange their crystal structure at certain heat levels. First, at once you get to about 770 degrees, iron loses its ferromagnetism and becomes paramagnetic, though we're not sure that the ancients were aware of the magnetic properties of iron as the heat level changes. Then, about 900 degrees, iron becomes an allotrope called austenite, which is often described as spongy iron. Carbon that's on the iron will start to dissolve into the iron at this point, and the amount of carbon that gets into the iron through this process drastically affects its properties. But the mix on this is very sensitive. One twentieth of a percent is enough to take you from wrought iron to mild steel. Then above a quarter percent carbon brings you to medium steel, half a percent carbon content to one percent carbon content, that's your sweet spot. That's the most desirable applications of steel for most purposes. But then once you get over two percent, suddenly you're into cast iron territory, which is far more brittle and which itself has different grades with different properties until you get to about 4.5% carbon, which is now pig iron and not terribly useful anymore. This spongy carbon absorbing stage is crucial, but it mostly lasts from about 900 degrees to just under 1400 degrees. Above 1400 but below 1540, you have delta iron, which has yet another set of properties, and then above 1540 degrees, you have liquid iron. None of these allotrope changes are immediately obvious to Bronze Age smiths, and were only described in these terms in much later eras. But what it means is that fluctuating temperatures make a big difference for all the different sorts of things you can do to iron while working it. The effect 
when it's beaten, will be different on different allotropes. And of course, carbon absorption, which was completely unknown in the Bronze Age, occurs within that certain window of temperature. Meaning that unlike every other metal they knew about at the time, it really mattered how, with iron how long you stay in that medium temperature range while you're getting the heat up as well as things like type and cleanliness of the charcoal, as well as a lot of other factors like the frequent presence of other random minerals in the iron, the shape of the furnace, the weather outside. It's a mess. Needless to say, iron metallurgy is far more complex than this brief summary, and I'm far from an expert in any of it. But this complexity is both the story of why the Bronze Age was the Bronze Age, because bronze is far simpler to work with in the forges that were available at the time, but it's also a big part of why iron could be experimented with at early stages as well. Iron being hugely variable meant that sometimes you could get lucky. You could put a pretty good piece together, especially with extremely good quality of ore, like you sometimes get from meteorite fragments. A lot of times meteorites have nickel in them as well as iron, and that nickel-iron compound, of course, has its own set of properties, but can be a little bit easier to work with. Iron, meanwhile, any kind of iron, not just meteoric iron, it can be worked at temperatures well below the melting point. And once a really good piece is made, especially if you accidentally create steel, it could be quite impressive. All this means that while we see occasional ironwork as far back as the start of history, quantities of iron produced only very slowly grow over the Bronze Age. By the late Bronze Age, it is a common enough material that we hear about it and have artifacts recovered. But a finished iron product, even a hundred years prior to the Bronze Age collapse, is worth about eight to ten times its weight in gold. I mean that literally. Making its use restricted to decorative and prestige artifacts, or sometimes for items in the finest of temples. Then the Bronze Age ends sharply around 1200 BCE, and we don't hear nearly as much from the civilizations of the Near East for a few hundred years. And when the light of historical record again dawns in our start date of 935 BCE, it dawns on a different world. In the Levant, 80 to 90 percent of practical tools and weapons are now in iron, rather than in copper and bronze. Remember, 300 years ago, that was 0%. In Mesopotamia, we're closer to a 50-50 split between iron and bronze or copper tools. But a century from now, that's already going to be up to 80 to 90%. Iron was adopted a lot faster in the western part of the Near East, in the Levant, than in Mesopotamia, not 100% sure why. It is an active area of debate and research. It's probably something economic, but we don't really know, just because we don't have enough records. Anyway, copper and bronze are still used for a number of applications, but the cost of iron has plummeted. Forges, broadly speaking, are now clearly comfortable with the material, and it's largely integrated into Near Eastern industry on an equal footing with all the other known metals. The question is, what happened in that dark period to make iron go from difficult to work with to commonly produced? And the answer is that we simply don't know. We haven't found, archaeologically, the forges that produced iron during this transition period. And in fact, we found remarkably few forges for the entire ancient period in the Near East. To make it worse, unlike bronze, iron rusts away. And while hundreds of unidentifiable rust fragments can be found at nearly any archaeological dig site for this Iron Age, even the very largest of cities rarely have more than 10 iron artifacts from this period, which can be properly examined and studied because they haven't, you know, rusted into a lump 
One thing that has changed was the economics of metal. With the collapse of in international trade, less tin and bronze working was coming into most communities. However, this can't be the entire story, since we know that on one hand bronze was still being traded internationally in this period, throughout the Bronze Age collapse, even if at lower volumes than it was before. And on the other hand, copper, tin, and bronze are almost infinitely recyclable, even with ancient smithing techniques. Meaning that the price of bronze could well have gone up in this period, almost certainly did, but it wouldn't have been unobtainable. One thing that must have changed, though we can't prove it, is that furnace temperatures must be rising, though not all the way to the melting point of iron, since pouring and casting is still only done in bronze and in other metals. But more importantly, they appear to have figured out the consistency thing to a much greater extent. They don't know the chemistry we have today, but centuries of trial and error have finally keyed them into the idea that the entire heating process for iron needs to be smooth and consistent to get consistent output, and that the initial heating needs to be as hot as possible to homogenize the metal, and that repeated runs of folding the metal and hammering it into itself can also improve the metal's consistency as well. But for all that consistency is key, the natural variation in each furnace, in each region's charcoal, in each weather pattern, and dozens of other factors mean that once you figure out the recipe for one forge in one area, if you ever change anything at all, or you move your forge, or you want to open a new forge in a different city, then all that has to get keyed in anew. A, pro a process which would only be manageable through extensive and exhausting trial and error. And this is why we see iron adoption spread only over centuries, from the region around Anatolia and the Levant, outwards to Greece, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Iranian mountains. The knowledge only spread gradually and fitfully through oral transmissions, or attempts by other smiths to replicate what they were seeing in neighboring communities. But once you've started to figure all this out and can regularly produce something consistent, iron is just vastly more abundant, meaning that prices can fall and you can create items that are just as good as bronze items, but you can make a lot more of them. Now I did say just as good and that's important. Iron didn't get adopted because it was better than bronze. In the earliest periods, it was objectively worse than bronze. But by this point, it's about equal to bronze in most qualities. There are differences in the two materials that make one more suitable than, for some applications than others, but Overall, a bronze sword and an iron sword in the 900s BCE are approximately equivalent as swords, and as far as we can tell, the same goes for axes and plows as well. Again, costs and benefits to each, but the economics of the region, the relative abundance of each metal, and the relative skill levels of the local smiths, that's what's driving adoption. I mean, for something like helmets, we see that iron helmets do protect a little bit better, but they're heavier than bronze helmets. So for the entire Mesopotamian Iron Age, we actually find a mix of bronze and iron helmets, even within the same armies, based entirely on the user's preferences. But the funny thing about iron is that, due to its abundance, the more you have, the more you want, and the cheaper it gets. The quantities of bronze were always limited by the fact that tin always had to be imported from far, far away. Iron, however, is present everywhere but the Mesopotamian plain itself, meaning that as the population rose, all these new farmers could have new sets of iron tools, as could the miners and the builders, as could the soldiers.
iron is going to be a logistical and economic advantage. Later, in the period after this podcast, ancient and classical era smiths will figure out how to consistently steal your iron to various different grades, and at that point iron will actually be a better material for most applications than pretty much any other metal. But for now, iron is a good enough material and getting cheaper by the day. There is, by the way, an effect of iron on the luxury markets, with a notable shift in the use of bronze, iron, gold, silver, lead, and other materials among high-status goods. However, the shift is radically different in different areas, with some places seeing bronze almost completely displace gold, other places seeing iron moving from a high-class luxury material into a middle-class jewelry material, but these shifts seem largely based on fashion and local economics more than anything systematic and are less significant than the move of plows and swords to iron. So while there's much that's obscure about the rise of iron, it does appear that abundance was a key motivating factor, and forging technology was the key limiting factor, which only now in the 900s is starting to come together to allow an iron age to really develop. At the same time as Assyria is experiencing the beginnings of metallurgical abundance, the region's also finally starting to experience a more fundamental sort of abundance, agricultural abundance. Now, the exact nature of the climate shift is debated and unclear, and the causes are generally thought to have just been random natural fluctuations, not ancient industrial facilities. But the period from 1200 to 900 BCE was, generally speaking, unusually hot and dry. The extent to which this contributed to the various events of the Bronze Age collapse are, again, unclear, but it is fairly certain that hotter and drier meant for the people of Mesopotamia less crops and lower river levels, meaning that trade on the shallower canals was more difficult and there was less to trade in the first place because everyone was hungry. This means that the land of the Middle East was able to support fewer humans per acre of land. That fact alone meant that in 1200 there were all of a sudden too many people for the land to feed, leading to the hard times of the collapse period. But once the population had settled to a lower amount, the resultant smaller, poorer cities led to decreased returns to urbanization. These decreased returns show themselves economically in the apparent inability of cities at this time to create lasting monuments, and their general inability to even fully maintain what was built by previous generations. They show themselves militarily in the ability, inability of even large cities to properly defend themselves from relatively small warrior bands. We already saw the increased weakness of the Assyrian military in the Middle Assyrian period as their accomplishments slowly diminished into the disastrous decline. We know almost nothing about Babylon during these dark days, but it does seem that they were struck by multiple types of war, both internal and external, during their period of weakness. That range, though, 1200 to 900, isn't a hard line. Things in some places were getting worse before 1200. In other places, things weren't bad until well after that, and similarly, the recovery was uneven and not tied to a specific year. Still, by 935, we get the impression that between the metallurgical abundance and the new agricultural surpluses, possibly a generation or two of these agricultural surpluses by now, the stage is finally set for a king of Asher to have rather more options open to him than were available to previous kings. All of that gets us from the general to the specific. It's always a question in history how circumstance is balanced by human initiative. There was once a thought 
called the great man theory of history, whereby all history was the result of human choices, and the greatest events were moved solely by the actions of the greatest men. On the other side of things, you get the highly deterministic theories like Marxist history, whereby history inevitably proceeds through certain phases on its way to an ultimate teleological end state. But most historians recognize that what's important here is the balance. And even if that actual balance is obscure to us, that's what really matters. Background conditions in Mesopotamia have been improving civilization for at least a few decades, and will continue to improve for decades to come. So in the line of kings from 950 to 900, say, it seems likely that one of them would have led Asher to break out of its funk. But then we have to wonder, were the kings before Asher Dan less ambitious and capable than he was, or was their time not yet right? Or on the other side of it, was Asher Dan a secret genius, and his gains perhaps were disproportionate to how well Asher was actually doing in his lifetime? All we can say is that Asher Dan II is the one who leads the Assyrian recovery. Some will call him the first king of the late Assyrian period. Some will call him the founder of the Assyrian Empire, or even the founder of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Some, meanwhile, will actually put all of those titles on kings that come a bit later, while acknowledging Asher Dan's contributions towards laying the foundations of what's to come. But what's important to remember is that no one in ancient times thought that Asher Dan was establishing anything. What we call the Neo-Assyrian Empire was simply a continuation of what had come before given that label millennia after the empire had risen and fallen by the early archaeologists who hadn't yet pieced together the full story of ancient history. So I will occasionally be using the term Neo-Assyria, especially in like social media posts, since that's what people are used to searching for and are used to hearing. But for the most part, this is the same Assyria that we've seen for a few centuries now. It's just on its way to being a bit larger than it was previously. Now, Ashurdan's father was the last of the obscure kings of whom we know nothing more than a name. Tukulti Apil Ashara, Hebraized more commonly as Tiglath Pileser, we don't know what kind of foundations he had laid for the city by the time of his death in 935 BCE. The impression we get, however, is that Asher is the chief city of a small region on the Upper Tigris at this point. It's the biggest fish, but in a very small pond. It's a town which bears the marks of former glory within its decaying walls. But as we said, populations are rising, and the introduction of iron is widening the availability of many common tools. Ashurdan II was the son of Tiglath Pileser II, and as far as we know, his succession was smooth. We don't yet have a firm chronology for when stuff happened in Ashurdan's reign, but we can construct it f something like the following. Upon taking the throne, Ashurdan appears to have understood clearly that his most valuable resource was his people, and everything he did from that point on was in service of growing the number of people in the Assyrian state. Unlike Assyrian kings for the last century or so, his annals survive, a single writing where he detailed his achievements. It is pretty hard to read, I mean, not just because it's in a cuneiform Akkadian, but because it's in real bad shape. But we hear that in his very first year, some folks from a from the south called Iausu, who seem to have been a tribe of Arameans, were at this point running rampant over the countryside, and they have pushed now into the Assyrian heartland in search of plunder and conquest. They were likely expecting a pretty easy victory, but Ashurdan was able to assemble some number of infantry and chariots and push them back. 
We don't know what the Assyrian army looks like at this point in history. We know it is going to change a lot, but we don't know how much change has already taken place. After the battle, Ashurdan was standing over the battlefield, slaughtering and enslaving those among the enemy who hadn't fled, and he decides that since everyone is already mustered, they might as well make a big campaign out of it. So they traveled down the Tigris River to the town of Ekelpinairi, about halfway between Asher and Babylon, in a territory not strongly held by either power at the moment, and they plunder every Aramean settlement along the entire river. When they reach Ekelpinari, which appears to be the capital of the Iaosu Arameans, they fight some sort of battle, slaughter all the survivors, and carry away a bunch of plunder, including large numbers of animals. And now, this isn't the first military victory of the Assyrians in a century. As bad as the Dark Age was, if they were never on the winning end when defending, they would have vanished from history long before. But it does appear to be the first expansion of Assyrian territory, the first aggressive victory in the living memory of anyone at the time. We've talked about military victory being a thing which legitimized a ruler, both showing the king's competence and his divine favor. But to take so much of the Tigris in his first outing after a long and dark century must have radically changed the mood among the Assyrians. Even if the only plunder was meat and wool, since we can't tell if anything else was captured in the broken parts of the tablet, that's still more of the two basic commodities than anyone's seen in their lives flooding into the city, relieving food and clothing insecurity among the people of Asher, probably for the first time in generations. Asherdan gets overshadowed by his successors, and that's fair enough. His achievements were modest compared to them. But the impact of bringing the first great success that anyone living had ever seen to a nation that, for all its struggles and starvation, remembers the tales of glory gone by, it had to have been electrifying. And so, at the victory party, Asherdan tells the people, think back, think back to Shalmaneser, who had ruled about a hundred years ago at this point. Now, this wasn't the great Middle Assyrian Shalmaneser, this was the lame one at the start of the Dark Age. Asherdan says that the loss of this territory around the Zab River, which merges with the Tigris a bit north of the Assyrian heartland, the loss of that territory to the Arameans corresponded, he says, to the decline in Assyrian fortunes. Not only is there valuable farmland there, since it's also close to enough to the Assyrian heartland, but also, just because it's nearby, the city of Asher hasn't been safe as long as the Arameans were so close. Therefore, Asherdan proposes that the army next go and clear the entire Zab River Valley, reconquer that area, area and of course, take all due plunder. This will restore Assyria's honor, her wealth, and her divine favor all in one fell swoop. Soon enough, they all march out, then they pillage and plunder, then the divine honor and favor has clearly been restored to Assyria, and everything is starting to build up some momentum. So then Asherdan tells everyone, hey, remember how during the reign of Asherdan's great-grandfather, the Arameans had taken the region somewhere kind of north of town, sort of at the foothills of those northern Armenian mountains. And since that time, they'd established their own little kingdom there, those awful Arameans. Well, this land needed to be returned to Assyrian rule, so he mustered his chariots and his infantry, and he marched up in that direction, and he conquered everything in his path, burning all that he didn't plunder. He ended up in a city called Halhalaush. We don't know exactly where it is, but it was the capital of that region, and he stood again victorious at the gates of that city.
Of note here, though, is that Asherdan doesn't just pillage the goods, burn the burnables, and slaughter the resistors, though, of course, he does do that as well. He also rounds up all the people of this region, all the surviving civilians, and he resettles them in the Assyrian heartland. Now, we saw resettlement back in the late Bronze Age, even in the years of the collapse when Assyria was still doing well. But at this point, there isn't that much Assyria to be settling people in. This policy of deportation only makes sense if Assyria has a bunch of empty land that could be worked, but currently isn't, because they don't have enough people. Ancient economies were, on average, Malthusian, which means that the population grew to whatever extent the agriculture could feed them, barring other factors. Therefore, it seems likely that the climate shift which is leading to the agricultural surpluses that are feeding all these military campaigns is a fairly recent phenomenon. That Asherdan is leading his armies at pretty much the earliest possible date, since the city of Asher hasn't had time to let natural population growth fill in that newly arable land. Another king might have looked at this agricultural surplus and thanked the gods, and given his people a bit of peace and prosperity. Not Asher Dan. He gives his neighbors blood and fire, because the Assyrians know that the greatest slaughters result in the greatest wealth. At least, that's true in the ancient economy. All this slaughter and resettlement really lets us know that Asherdan is 100% in tune with the Middle Assyrian kings we already saw building up the kingdom from 1300 to 1100, and emphasizes the continuity with what's going to be coming. Anyway, Asherdan is no longer motivated by the desire to recover territories lost by his forefathers, or at least he's no longer using that as his explicit justification. It's actually going to be a bit of a challenge to reintegrate those captured territories back into the atrophied regional governance structure. But since we don't hear very much about it, we're just going to assume that it went reasonably smoothly. But just because he's lost that one justification now that he's conquered all these lands, doesn't mean he's going to stop conquering. No, no, no. At this point, he's proved himself to gods and men, and so the patron god of the city of Asher, who is the god Asher, takes Asher Dan as his champion, and then just starts instructing the king to go attack this place, go attack that place. And Asher Dan starts off on the right foot, by heading to the Khabar region to the west, to the land of Katmuhu. These are probably Aramaeans, and capturing that city brings a nice variety of more plunder. He gets some tin, some bronze, some gemstones, and so forth. But Assyria can't yet integrate a place this far away into the nation just yet. It needs to be made into a tributary state instead. So Asherdan decides that the best way to institute regime change is to take the current king, a fellow named Kundib Hale, and he takes him back to the Assyrian city of Arba'il. There, the Aramean leader is publicly skinned alive, then the skin is sent back to hang like a flag over the walls of the conquered town. Then Asherdan goes up to another guy whose name is unreadable, and he says, Hey you, how about you try being king? and maybe consider being a bit more pro-Assyria in your kingly policy outlook. And then he points over to that city wall where there's a bunch of skin hanging off the wall. And you know what? This new king seems to work out pretty well for Asher Dan. But not everyone gets the message. Asherdan next dashes over to Musru, one of the towns he conquered in a previous campaign, since they've risen up in rebellion. So he destroyed the city more profoundly than it had been destroyed the first time. And that's kind of the downside of the Assyrian annals. They always claim to have utterly destroyed everywhere they go. And we, we know it usually isn't true. They subjugated city, 
it goes through a pretty hard time during conquest, but it usually isn't totally destroyed. However, it sometimes it happens that the enemy city actually does resist to a degree that it does get totally destroyed. And because the rhetoric is always cranked up to such a high volume, it's hard to tell what each city's punishments actually looked like without extra context. Anyway, we also know that the great god commanded Asher Dan at some point to attack northeast to the mountain foothill in that direction. And those towns get conquered, pillaged, and plundered pretty solidly as well. At this point, Asherdan has traveled in every major direction and defeated every notable concentration of Arameans in the region. He's gone north, south, east, and west, and he's set a nice solid core around the Tigris as a foundation of the newly resurgent Assyrian kingdom. Now that the city is safe, the first thing he does is restore the great temple of the patron god Asher and puts all its rituals back in order which had been cut back due to the lack of funds in previous generations. Gotta have that divine favor on your side after all. But once that's taken care of, Asher Dan does something pretty interesting. He calls to all the Assyrian people who are not currently in Assyria. And he tells them all that it's safe now, and they should come home. We can recall that earlier phases of the Assyrian nation saw their borders expand pretty widely. And it seems that when those areas were captured by enemies and lost contact with the mother city, that at least some of the Assyrian people remained in the land, and more importantly, remained Assyrian without losing their identity. Further, in the hard centuries, it seems likely that Assyrian people fled from the heartland in search of more peaceful or more fertile areas, or possibly fled up into the more defensible mountains of the north and east. Asherdan needs people, because he seems to know that people are the strength of a nation, and so he portrays himself as a loving father, to bring these wayward sons of Asher home, after perhaps a century or maybe even more in some cases. We don't get numbers here, but if he's boasting about it, we should assume he met a degree of success that he was satisfied by. And to me, this seems like the sort of real statesmanship and economic shrewdness that more average kings might simply fail to think of indicating that Asher Dan was probably remarkable in his competence, not just the benefactor of an improving situation. And the last thing in Asher Dan's fragmentary annals that we can read is that he boasts of a career of great hunting expeditions, slaying 120 lions, 1,600 bulls, and 56 elephants. This shows, more than anything, the ritual continuation from earlier Assyrian rulers, who boasted of their hunting prowess in the same terms, though of course with different numbers, to demonstrate their virility, divine favor, and right to rule over the whole of the earth, not merely the human realm. I will confess to feel, feeling emotionally a bit more strongly about the elephants, than I do about the slaughtered victims in the cities, but it's probably my own numbness to violence because of a constant diet of action movies and war novels and history studies. It's probably a personal failing on my end, but that's going to finish us up for today. The foundations of the Neo-Assyrian Empire have been solidly laid, and as we move into the year 912, our world and our sources are going to start opening up in new and fascinating ways. But it isn't just our sources that are changing. The Oldest Stories podcast is also at least attempting to step things up a bit. Most obviously, I'm now doing video podcasting. So for people who really like to have something to look at, you can look at my face while I record. Plus sometimes some maps or whatever other visuals I find laying around. If you aren't interested in that, the audio portion of the show will still be exactly the same. My research and scripting process is the same as it's always been. 
but two more things are also ready to be announced. Those on TikTok or TikTok or YouTube know that I've started posting little one minute daily history facts again. I did that like two years ago or something, and that's just something that's going to come in and out as I have time for it. I do enjoy it, but it also does take a bit of time, so expect it to fade away at some point. But if you're into that kind of stuff, go to YouTube or TikTok and subscribe because I will be posting that history stuff when I can. The other big announcement is a spin-off channel right here on YouTube with an audio version on podcast to come soon when I can figure that out because I don't know apparently I can do that on Spotify but I don't I don't know. Anyway, you might have noticed last year but I'm kind of a fan of Jesus and Though I know I did a pretty poor job keeping the Israel series theologically neutral, please believe me, I definitely tried. In the new channel, though, I'm going to be looking at much more explicitly theological topics, many related to history and many not. The channel is called Christ and Questions, link in the description, and it's basically me just going through my list of questions about the scriptures one by one, considering each question as broadly as I can, sometimes reaching a conclusion and sometimes not. Already, by the time you see this, I've posted a more in-depth exploration of Abraham's historical context, and specifically the problems of Genesis 14. And I've looked at the moral content of the killings of Elijah and Elisha and used that as a springboard to ask what ethical theories are implicitly endorsed and which are rejected by the Bible texts. I'm also looking at something like Samuel's imposition or resistance to the imposition of a kingship in Israel and what that suggests about the theory of governance promoted by God. I want to look at the Tablet of Nations in Genesis 10. I want to look at what that means for Chinese history. I won't have a... I got a lot of stuff. I got 587 questions. And that's that's not a one of those arbitrary funny numbers. That's how big my list of questions that I want to make episodes on is at the moment. I'm not going to have a regular schedule for this. I know... A lot, of, a lot of you barely made it through an entire year of Israel, though, which is why it's all going on a separate channel. But if any of that sounds interesting to any of you, consider subscribing and checking out the videos over there. So, Oldest Stories is now video podcasts, occasional TikToks, and a philosophical and theological spinoff show. And hopefully I'm going to start making some money. I've got those books, remember? More coming soon. Anyway, I'm terrible at pretty much all of the side stuff for the podcast, the advertising, the community interaction, the what have you. So I'm going to keep relying mostly on you listeners to keep spreading the word. Keep putting reviews in your podcast apps. Keep putting comments in the YouTube pages. And most importantly, Keep sharing the stuff you see with folks that you think might be interested. But the core of the project, the research and the stories that come out of it, will continue to the best of my ability, using all my free time and a little bit more. So join us next time for Asher Dan's son, Adad Nirari, who's going to be just like his father, but bigger and more well-documented, and we're going to have a great time for a long time to come. Thank you for listening.